OJ. Hey, OJ. Hey, Jesse. How are you doing? Good, Can't man. Can't complain, man. It's a nice piece you got on the wall over there. It looks pretty awesome. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, cool. uh, so I'll start off with uh, saying, were there any hesitants in doing this show? You guys both were on beloved TV shows before on TV and now jumping to streaming. Were there any uh, reticence in joining the boys? They know. I mean, quality work is quality work. And when they send me the material, I could tell that it was of great quality. I could tell that, you know, that uh, the people involved cared about the material. And although it doesn't, you know, it didn't come off as something that would be um, just as it seemed, I knew that it would turn out to be good. You know, it's like a hummus dish where it looks different than what it tastes like when you're tasted you're very pleased and i knew that this would be one of those things yeah for me i i you know i <laughs> well you know reading it right away i was like blown away i'm like i love this character i get it i get the sad power there's obviously some dark material um but for me to go from uh you know a show like you know a show like i was on previously to do anything to switch it up and to have some fun and go in a completely different direction and, and basically to play a guy who is a, a arrested development like kinder at a kindergarten level i mean you know it was it was kind of fun so yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> these references i mean um <laughs> we got kindergarten we got hummus um both of you guys have i say two of the darkest storylines on the show what do you tap into for that? I mean, for you, it's they're both pretty dark, I will say, and deep. Yeah. And deep. <laughs> the deep. Yeah. Yeah. For some of that stuff in season one, I, you know, I think the scene was different when we were auditioning for it, but they wanted that moment in there from, you know, they're kind of trying to be true to the comics as well. And it's a big, you know, jumping off point for Starlight. And, uh, that was tough to be honest. I mean, it, we, we rehearsed it and talked about it quite a bit and, um, you know, uh, you know, there's obviously so much bizarre material that came after like the dolphin stuff. I was kind of like, totally, I don't know what people are going to think of this character, but let's just, let's just go for it. And that was the theme, theme of the show. And, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, happy to be a part of a show where they're not really shying away from these issues and these topics. And they're, you know, showing it through this lens uh, of, of the superhero world. Um, but it, it makes it for very interesting, you know, conversation within that. So. Yeah, luckily, they've done a great job of building this world around us and um, rooting everything in realism. So you can, you know, although it's amplified to a great extent, you can kind of just take principles that we're familiar with and apply them to these characters and have it sort of work. Um, you know, like we've all felt selfishness at one point. So you kind of just take that and you add it to a very subtle component to the, the structure of these characters. And then the way it pans out because of the scenario that, they, that they're that they in, um, it just works for the story. But to be honest with you, that's the benefit of having them deal with real world issues is that you can take some version of it that's eerily familiar and then just apply it to the situation. And, you know, we get the boys. Um, I want to say, Last season, you guys are both like right there before, so dark. Season two, redemption possibly for both your characters, a story of, of you know, likability. <laughs> likability, maybe redemption. Eh, we'll see. <laughs> redemption is a process for these guys. They've dug themselves into some pretty deep ditches, and it's going to take a long time. Uh, that road to redemption is a lot longer than either of them, either of them would like to. Uh, go through but you know it is what it is chase what you think yeah i agree i mean i think likability is one thing and then and then um you know i don't know if they if he can ever even really be redeemed i think he would like to think that he can that he can get redeemed enough to where i still don't think he's really processed or gotten to the point where he can accept that like oh my god everything could be over because of this thing and there's got to be a way to get back to where to where I was. I can just apologize a few times, or what do I have to do? What hoops do I have to jump through to sort of make it look like I'm 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 sorry? And uh, you know that's just not going to work. So stay tuned. <laughs> we will. I'm so glad to have it back in my life. Uh, you guys are. I want to thank the leaders of the crew. Uh, talk about how that dynamic of being the leader goes into your performance. Leader number one. Oh, well, um, 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's interesting in where we find uh, Billy Butcher and the boys in season two is they're, you know, uh, wanted criminals uh, hiding in the basement of a uh, of, of this uh, gang. And, uh, you know, Billy Butcher, after abandoning the boys in season one, his possession of, you know, unquestioned leadership is getting called into question. And I think the wonderful thing about season two is that you really come to you know, to discover that there is far more of a uh, uh, a voice and a democracy within the boys. It's not just this autocratic, you know, organisation. There's all we are an eclectic group of uh, individuals with specialistic qualities that um, have to overcome our own personal uh, issues and uh, learn to work together in order to. Um, uh, get traction on defeating the seven. Yeah, and as far as Mother's Milk, you know, he doesn't want to be a leader. He really just wants to accomplish the mission. Um, and I think that uh, Butcher knows that bringing Mother's Milk on board uh, would help him accomplish a mission and keep him on track because that thirst for revenge could very easily derail him and derail the team into just a bloodthirsty need to destroy the seven. And, uh, and he had a very specific goal that uh, only somebody like a mother's milk would constantly be bringing, bringing him from veering up, bringing him back to center, as well as the other members who tend to, you know, um, uh, get carried away in, 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 in these, in, in these, uh, uh, missions that we all have yeah i feel like at the root of both of your characters is family you're both trying to ultimately get back to your family how does that flow with the, how you portray your characters you know i think that story? for Mother's milk particularly uh that's what causes him to also personally hold back and play things a little more cautiously because he wants to get back to that family he is a very involved father in his daughter's life and the reason why he even sacrifices his family to go back to the boys is because of family. Because mm -hmm. in season two, you'll find out how Mother's Milk's father and something that happened with his father is the reason why Mother's Milk has to avenge, you know, that situation. And the only way he could achieve that is through the boys. And being a part of this group could potentially break that generational curse that he doesn't want to pass on to his own daughter. That was deep. That we was get deep, man. <laughs> that that deep. was good. Yeah. That was good. I appreciate it. Cool. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Jack. Hey. Hi. How's it going? Hey. Good. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That's about as enthusiastic as we can get this day these days. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, I feel you. You know, it feels like a pretty good time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, thank God we have the boys to cheer us up. I've missed it. So, uh, <laughs> season one, you guys ended kind of rocky. Uh, season two, do we see you guys repairing or moving forward? What What can we expect? Hmm. I mean, there's a lot more rockiness in the future. <laughs> I don't think you can go through what they went through without it staying rocky for a little while. Um, you know, the question of reparations is the big question. I will say that um, it's going to take a lot for Huey to gain back Annie's trust. And, you know, whether he's able to or not, I can't say, but it would take a lot. Yeah, uh, and I think Huey knows that. I think he knows just how bad he messed up um, during the events of season one. And, you know, he wants nothing more in this world than to get back together with Annie and, and try to bring some sort of sense of normalcy back into his life. Uh, but it's he knows it's going to be a long road to get there. So they're, they're in a way kind of forced to uh, work together, um, but they have to put their feelings, whether they're positive or negative, aside to kind of accomplish the mission. But Huey is hoping maybe there's something um, um, there, there but, but he doesn't know. The ball's in Annie's court. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Annie slash Starlight, 
Starlight, we see her go on a journey, such a roller coaster of a journey last season. Are, do we see her again fighting against the corporation and continuing her, I guess, rebellious way of fighting against the man? Do we see more of that from Starlight? We definitely do. It's just the methods by which she fights against the man change entirely. Um, and from an optical standpoint, you'd think she's totally conforming, but she's ask, actually, you know, just wearing a facade for the entirety of the season. And really in season two, it's a matter of her going undercover and realizing that um, trying to explicitly and outwardly rebel against the corporation is not going to allow her to achieve what she wants. And that's staying within Vought and perhaps being an eye inside the, you know, behind the closed doors of Vought is going to provide more help to be anti-corporation than um, being rebellious. Jack, last season, we saw your character also go on a roller coaster of a journey. Uh, last season, we saw Carl Urban's character kind of just leave you guys in the whim. Yes. And, and I think Jack, uh, say, your character is a little pissed about it. He's, he's a little <laughs> pissed. Um, can you talk about your dynamic with Carl's character a little bit this season? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I thought that was one of the more interesting parts of the season for me is, is Huey and Butcher having to renegotiate the terms of their relationship in a way. Uh, Huey very much needed somebody like Butcher uh, in season one because, you know, he was a character that struggled to uh, fight. You know, I think his dad says you, you're, you've never had the fight, you've never had it. Um, and his one role model, like big male role model is his dad who just sits on the couch all day. And Butcher was this symbol of, you know, fighting for justice and fighting um, to, you know, get revenge basically for his girlfriend. This season though, Huey, Huey knows, Huey knows uh, all of Butcher's tricks and it's gonna be harder for him to pull the wool over Huey's eyes. So he's on to him. And now that Huey doesn't need him in the same way anymore, where do the two characters stand? And negotiating that relationship with Carl was, was really interesting to see. And uh, definitely Huey is pissed when Butcher comes back, but I think it takes some interesting turns later in the season that I think audiences are really going to like.